Who here has ever had the misfortune of having to develop any piece of software which works on iOS 6? No one, no one here did any web dev in the late, late 2000s? Okay, anyone remember using iOS 6 in the late 2000s? It was. Okay. Yes, it was completely. Remember, like, how completely terrible um, IE6 was. And um, I guess the point of my talk is that a, a 2020s Google monopoly will not actually be any better. Like, it will be um, in the same horrible situation um, you know, in the world of IoT and things as there were in the world of desktop software um, uh, in the late 90s. And uh, I actually just went to the, the talk on Android Things, and it turns out it really is more terrible than you ever thought because with Android Things, they're going to use signing and sign bootloaders so that you can never ever possibly install um, an open alternative on any of the pieces of hardware that they sell. Um, and the thing that I sort of believe is that platforms here are not really the answer. So, this idea of one vendor providing an all encompassing um, solution to, um, to whatever particular problem you have that they completely control is not really where we want to go with the world of IoT. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there who would dearly like to be the... Sorry. Um, there are a lot of, uh, lot of companies out there uh, who would dearly like to be the... Um, mid early 2000s equivalent of of Microsoft where they want to have this this power and because that's clearly going to make you an awful lot of money there's an awful lot of investor money chasing all of this um, this world as well so um, Google's a big player but there's there's dozens of them from like you know the smallest uh, few man band startups going up um, but they're all basically based on the same principle, which is um, we're going to lock you into our platform with some bottom end, with some, with some server side, um, and they're all going to, one of those is eventually going to win, and then we all end up in this horrible world of IE6, so I kind of want to put an end to that. And what I think a better solution is one that's based more on, uh, on a bunch of tools that you can piece together to solve your problem. Um, and then when one tool sucks or one tool vendor starts becoming too arrogant, you can go and throw their tool away and go and use a different one, and the rest of your system works uh, as it always used to. And uh, for me, like that tool, that thing that I want to solve um, is over-the-air updates. Um, and this is kind of interesting because sort of basically everything needs one in the end. Um, whatever you're doing, if it's running Linux, you're going to have to um, update the thing in the field. And there are a bunch, like it has been solved before, um, but it's not what I call like a solved problem. There's not, uh, like if you, want, if you want a C compiler, you can just go, there's two, they're both really good. Um, but software updates, there's a bunch of solutions and they're all kind of compromises in slightly different fashions. And there hasn't really been a, a kind of um, a bringing together where all of these, um, all of these uh, projects kind of come towards a single project that sort of solves everyone's problems more or less completely for most cases for more or less everyone and when someone says okay I need to do software updates you can say okay we'll do it like this. Um, so I'm not going to claim that this is that solution but I'm what I'm going to talk about is that solution but I, I want to kind of push towards that way and hopefully um, we can build a thing which is open and lets everyone solve this problem. Uh, so when talking about software updates, one of the most common um, or one obvious uh, solution for doing this uh, is to use the package managers which are already built into your, into your operating system. So for example, RPM or DEB. And this has the advantage that it's uh, quite easy to do. There's, um, you're familiar with the tooling already and Yocta already generates RPMs. Um, so it's just sort of a matter of piecing those bits together with the server to serve the updates down or, or maybe you run a, an app repository or something. Um, so easy is its advantage. Um, disadvantage uh, though is uh, that it's not safe during power off. So if you're in the middle of installing an update and somebody pulls the power on your device, uh, then it's left in an indeterminate state and um, that's kind of okay for computers 
I mean, people still hate it, like the, I'm sorry, I'm updating your system, you may not use it or touch it or turn it off or do anything with it. Um, but it's not really okay for a thing that people consider to be a, be a device. It's a, it's a physical lump of metal and you kind of expect to be able to do whatever you like with it. Um, now the other, so that's one problem. Um, and the other problem is uh, that when you're installing RPM packages, you have um, the issue of dependency resolution. So you might have um, one application that depends on some version of a library. And there will always be uh, some set of versions which have been tested, or at least you're reasonably sure will work together. Um, now, the problem is, and if you've ever used um, like non-stable versions of Debian, then I'm sure you've probably hit this an error. It looks a bit like this one here. Um, this was the first result from Stack Overflow when I typed it in. But you run app get update, app get upgrade, and it says, um, I'm really sorry I can't continue because really complicated reason involving package versions that conflict. Um, and this problem is, is actually really, really hard. And so if anyone here is a De Debian developer, I have um, like amazing thanks to you guys who managed to keep this thing working at all. Um, but you have this problem where you can have a version of the system which is um, self-contained, which is correct um, and installable over here, which is okay. And you can say that the latest versions of all of your packages are also, as a collection, installable together. But there's no way of migrating from this old world to this new world. And that's sort of what this error is um, here somewhere. Um, and, and actually solving this is really hard. Um, the Haskell guys actually use an automated theorem prover to try and figure out how to do package updates um, on their system, uh, which is clever, but is maybe not the right solution. Um, so the, like, another um, alternative to this is to instead of having a system which is fundamentally um, a long history of composed package installs and removes, uh, you write your entire um, file system and have two copies of that file system. You, rather than distribute packages, you distribute an entire root file system as a single unit. Um, so the way this works uh, is you, uh, you take your flash and um, divide it up into kind of two partitions, so you have an old version and a new version, and you also need a bootloader, so that's a third, and you probably also need some space for changes that users might want to make. So you end up with a, a partition layout that looks a bit like this, um, and maybe with two extra partitions if you want to be able to, um, if your kernel lives on its own partition. Um, and this is safe, right, because uh, you're running the system from, uh, from partition A, uh, and then whilst you're running that, you install your updates on the B partition, and then right when it's completely finished, flush to disk, you make a, a switch in the bootloader, uh, and now with next time it boots, it boots your there's some disadvantages to this that make it quite um, harder to do in practice than it is uh, in theory. Um, so the first one of these is that um, you need to partition this flash during manufacture, and that flash layout is one of the things which you can't possibly ever update after the system has left the factory using this method. Um, and exactly where to split those partitions is a, is a very annoying problem because um, if you make the partitions too small, then you won't be able to install your latest, greatest software. Um, but so, okay, so we'll make the partitions really big, but then you have all of this unused space at the end of these partitions, um, which you can't use for, um, which you have to pay for, and which you can't use for the user to do whatever they're doing, storing their files, backups, whatever. Um, and even worse than that, you have to pay that this cost twice, um, once for the A partition, once for the B partition. Um, so that's a, that makes it more expensive than it would uh, otherwise need to be. Um, and it's, it's actually not super trivial to do um, read-only root FS uh, is kind of sort of in Yocto. Um, if you do a Google search for read-only root FS, you'll find uh, long descriptions on, on how to do it. But it's, if, if you're not doing it today, it's probably a little bit harder than you expect to make this work. Um, because most um, Linux applications unmodified will assume that they can kind of write things more or less wherever they please. And some places are reasonably good about keeping writing things into var and lib, um, but you end up having to make this very strong split between files which are updated by 
the vendor, by you, um, and files which are updated by the user. And without making that split um, um, very hard, it's very easy to find that, um, for example, some files in slash etc, you want the user to modify, and other files, actually you as the, you as the vendor want to, want to supply updates to. So it's doable, but it's quite hard to do. And the, the fourth point is that the work to do these changes is often quite hard to reuse between projects. And I think that's kind of what we see today with these, um, with these systems, that lots of people have done this as part of a production situation. But there isn't really like an open source project where everybody upstreams all their stuff into it and it becomes a, it becomes a system that everybody can just use and you kind of get this benefit of, um, of, sh of sharing going on. And they tend to be like a once-off project to uh, get this thing out the door and then maybe you modify it and reuse it internally, but it's not a, it's not a, a public piece of commons software that we can all use, even if it's, um, even if it's open source and um, freely licensed and available on GitHub, that's different from actually in practice being able to share these updates between a people with completely different ideas about what they want to build. Um, so the, um, the technology I want to talk about today um, is this thing called OS Tree. Now, the way to think about OS Tree is it's a bit like Git, but for file systems. Um, so um, one OS Tree commit uh, corresponds to a, to a complete root file system image. And you can have multiple of these commits inside a single flash partition um, on your device. Um, and there, you can then have multiple checkouts of this software um, on that flash partition, which lets you do um, atomic switches between, um, between versions of your software. Um, now, this wasn't developed by me. Uh, I, I don't want to take credit for it. This came out of um, the GNOME Continuous Project, and um, Colin Walters is sort of the, the guy behind it. Um, but I'm really happy with it and super keen on it, and I want to talk about it some more. Uh, so, because it has this model of, um, of sort of a Git model of um, content addressed objects, um, doing things like incremental fetches of changes to your file system are very, very easy. So with, um, with that dual bank system that we talked about earlier, uh, you have problems, for example, that might be hundreds of megabytes and you might need to be downloading that over um, well, maybe Wi-Fi, but quite possibly um, a 3G connection. And so you're going to have to have some kind of um, compression to, to send that update. And you could use rsync, but it's a bit of a pain. You could use um, bsdiff, um, bspatch in order to send those updates. But it's, it's a whole bunch of extra work that you have to do in order to make this thing um, sort of usable in a practical production situation. Uh, with um, OS tree, it works very similarly to a Git um, the dumb HTTP transport. So you can put all of your updates up on a server somewhere and then just go and fetch them down um, incrementally. Um, and your and Git pull and, and OS tree pull, um, basically you, you say, go and pull this hash, pull this commit, and it will go and fetch that commit from the server. And then any objects that are not referenced, it will go and fetch those as well until it's built an entire system in a local sort of content addressed object store. Um, one thing to be aware of is it's uh, not actually Git here. Um, Git has a very, very simple permission, deliberately has a very simple permissions model um, where there's basically directory and executable bit and nothing else. Um, whereas OS tree has a full set of, um, a full set of permissions. So it contains user IDs for files. It contains the normal um, Unix style um, permission bits and also all of the extended attributes that you need for SE Linux. Um, and smack labels and things like that. So it's um, it's more complete than Git in that respect because it's, it's designed for, for a file system image rather than for a bunch of source code. Um, I think the, the other change is it doesn't use SHA-1 hashes to identify objects. It uses SHA-256 or some cropped version of that, which if you're following the news today, you know, SHA-1 collisions, blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's safe against that, um, although it's probably not actually a security threat in, in practice. Um, so I've kind of described it uh, in relation to Git, so I thought I'd also try and explain what, the, what it looks like on disk. We'll come at this from a different angle. So this is a um, Raspberry Pi 
um, file system layout. Uh, so we have uh, two partitions here, one um, this sort of small partition, uh, which is basically just the, the bootloader. Um, and we're actually using uBoot on Raspberry Pi, it does work. Um, and uh, this is probably only you know, a few tens of megabytes. And then the whole of the rest of the SD card um, is, a, is a single file system. So it, it can be any file system you like, so um, F2FS or X4 or, or your favorite. And then um, inside this, uh, this file system, and this is sort of like the root file system image, but um, it doesn't look like a traditional um, unit or root file system. So uh, the actual root FSs are down in a, um, in a subdirectory quite a long way down. Um, and we've got two of them on this particular layout. So this is the first uh, root file system, and this is the second um, root file system. And when the system's booted, it will, uh, it will chirrut down into this point. Um, and then there's some um, bootloader magic, and this uh, objects directory, which holds, um, which is the same as your, as your Git uh, objects directory. This is holding the content of files um, named after their, after their j-hashes. Um, so the, the terminology there is we've got deployment sysroots and a physical sysroot to distinguish between these um, uh, these two um, root file systems. Um, and one of the nice things about this way of doing things is that um, you can use hard links in order to share um, files which have the same physical, the same bitwise content. Um, between an old and a new um, deployment. So this means that rather than having to, uh, in the dual bank case, you have to have two complete copies plus a bit of your entire system. With OS tree, if the files are identical between the pre-update and the post-update, they only have a single, um, there's only a single file actually on disk. Now there'll be multiple um, direct directory entries pointing to that file, um, but if you've got a large, large content that doesn't change um, between releases, then this is going to offer quite a big saving. Um, and in any case, um, it will generally mean that rather than needing more than double of your file system, you'll need significantly less. Um, and so that you can imagine how this works when it's checking out a file, it knows the hash of the file, and it will go and hard link it from um, something in this, uh, in this objects directory of files identified by their, um, uh, by their hashes. Now, um, one thing, this does sound beautiful and rosy, but when you're doing a checkout, you do still have to create all of the directories because um, hard links in uh, Linux are to files only, not to directories. So if you have two directories that happen to say happen to have exactly the same content, you still have to have two copies of the directory on disk. But that's obviously much smaller than any file for most practical systems. Uh, but it does mean that the checkout takes like um, tens of seconds where in theory it could only take a few seconds. Um, so um, that's the, uh, I've sort of described the layout of the, of the file system on disk, the physical, the physical root file system um, inside the flash. But, actually, but now I want to talk a little bit about how this looks as a, as a user land application uh, inside this update environment. Um, and so inside um, an OS3 deployed environment, it looks actually very, very similar to a, to a standard um, Unix, uh, Linux um, file system. So um, there, are some, uh, there are some changes here, um, and those are all related to the idea of things which are managed by, um, things which are read-write, which belong to the, to the device itself, and things which belong to the, um, the vendor, the person supplying the file system update. So um, uh, OS tree requires um, the user bin merge. Um, the scripts that, that we have at the moment um, does that for you, so you don't need to worry about it. But basically, all of the executables go into the user bin. Um, and all of everything in there is read-only. Um, and even though the file system itself is a, is a read-write file system, because we, we use the same um, ext file system to store read-write data as well, um, the, it's bound out with a read-only bit set. So um, even badly behaved applications can't go and corrupt, um, corrupt these files. Um, now, so that's everything in user, read-only. 
uh, managed by uh, the OS3 update process. Um, everything in var is read-write, and uh, that's for your storage of your user data. And in fact, OS3 moves um, slash home into var as well, so um, I think we symlink slash home um, across. So the home directories live in there, things like conman, Wi-Fi, <coughs> wireless configurations, all that stuff belongs in there. Um, and unlike um, some of the ways of doing this, we actually pre-populate that with um, whatever var contains when you do the build. Uh, so this means that the system doesn't have to be able to survive completely blowing away var to, to an empty directory and then automatically creating directories and things it needs on startup. Um, if you have a system that does that, so I think the system D guys are pushing towards this, um, this system D stateless stuff where they're, they're planning on having a very, very, very strict district, um, uh, distinction between read-only files which are part of the operating system and then like a read-write area where you can store files. But as an application, um, you have to assume that at any point someone can just go and like RM minus R, that whole read-write partition, and you have to be able to create that from scratch. This isn't as aggressive. This is um, it's pre-populated by whatever the first build of your software was. Um, and so if you're having a very, very long update chain, then you do have to be able to create um, directory items and new things in there. But the basic uh, overlay of that is, is going to be provided as part of the build and will be on the flash when you boot for the first time. Um, uh, slash etc is, is a little bit magic. Um, it's actually three-way merged between um, the old version of etc and the old and new update versions. And this is done by OS3. Now, there's a kind of a question here about how safe that is, right? Because if you're doing three-way merges, then uh, there's clearly a possibility for three-way merge failing. Um, now, that's definitely true, um, but it has a really nice advantage which is that during the kind of early stage of this process, uh, you can be a little bit lax about which files in ETC are managed by uh, the user and which are managed by the software update process. Um, and this is actually one of the one of the areas that makes read-only rootfs quite hard to do because um, some files in ETC are you do actually want to be able to change as a user part, and some it's really not clear. Um, so for example, um, settings for uh, not Wi-Fi credentials themselves, but more general, like which Wi-Fi devices are online, those sort of settings could be in either category, right? They could be a thing that we want to be able to push out as a vendor, or they could be a thing which maybe there's some application which lets you change it as a user. Um, and in the early days of a, of a project, it's probably actually a bit of a pain to have to, to manually sort through all of those cases and say, okay, this file is definitely managed by one, but this is definitely managed by someone else. Um, with this ETC three-way merge, uh, it just sort of does that in most cases automatically for you. Uh, and then towards the end of the project, you're gonna to migrate to something that looks more like uh, systemd stateless, where all of the configuration files which belong to the system are all inside uh, user and all of the things that belong to uh, the local device configuration belong inside Val. Uh, but that's one of those processes that right now, you know, some system, some parts of some systems do it well, but there's quite, it's quite easy to find applications that don't, don't kind of understand that or not in that world um, yet. And then finally, um, as a user, a land application, you have this bind mount to to the right back to the top of this whole tree, and that's used by the OS3 tools to, to push software updates. Um, so that's the um, that's what user space looks like as an application. Um, the boot process uh, for this is actually um, relatively straightforward. It's more or less as you'd expect, uh, given the rest of the description. So um, we boot with a, um, a boot uh, a bootloader. Um, you boot. So right now, all of the all of the things we've done have used U boot as the first bootloader. It's pretty straightforward to move it to other ones. Um, but so far, it's always been easier just to run boot, run U boot on top of whatever we have on the, uh, there already on the platform, rather than port our work to a, to a new bootloader. But it's it's pretty straightforward. There's like tens of lines of code that need to be uh, integrated at that point. So the bootloader picks a deployment um, 
and this this is where the sort of the AB atomic switch is happening uh, in the bootloader. Um, that that deployment identifies a kernel. You boot the kernel, and then there's a init RD that has to be uh, aware of OS tree, um, and that init RD is responsible for um, doing this Churu process, where we rather than having the root of our SD card as the top of the file system tree, we're going to churu down uh, keyed on this deployment. Um, so it does that, sets up these bind mounts, and then um, runs your SBIN in it, and the system boots as normal. Uh, the uh, update process is quite nice. So updates, um, updates run in the background, and so you never have to go into this um, I'm updating your Android phone uh, mode, which is quite nice for users. Uh, so the first step of the update process is to, um, given, a, given a root hash, so your update process starts by saying, OK, please deploy root hash, long hash, onto my system. Uh, it goes, uh, so OS tree will go to a server and fetch down any missing objects. Um, that fetch process, um, you can use a dumb HTTP server uh, if, you're, if you don't need um, privacy of the actual content of your update. Uh, because all these uh, objects are, are identified by their hash, there's no way that someone who can, uh, who can intercept that communication can, um, for example, put random files on your system because as soon as they're downloaded, they're checksummed by OS stream before they're written to this. Uh, so you fetch all these, all these objects down, so you now have a complete um, set of objects that represent the file system. And that's obviously incremental. So any objects you have already, what those. Um, there's then a process that takes all these, uh, so that's a bit like git pull, and then there's a process which is a bit like git checkout, where it goes and builds a churu environment that hard links back to all those objects it's just fetched. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, there's the atomic point where you flip the next boot in the bootloader, um, and then, then the system basically has to wait for a reboot. Um, so one of the things to note here is that none of None of, none of those changes are visible inside the Linux uh, user space. And this is a lot unlike, for example, an RPM system where when you install a package, um, it's just going to randomly change some files on disk under potentially running applications. And like that mostly works because if you've got a, DL, if you've got, um, a library and you've got it open, then because you're holding it open, you still keep reading the old version. Um, but it's also possible to hit situations where applications start behaving a bit weirdly because libraries that they depend on have been overwritten underneath them. And we don't have this problem because we're building a completely new file system somewhere else that none of the user space applications can see or care about. And then when the system next boots, we will get that, that, will get that as, our, as our root file system. Um, and the question about when to reboot is kind of out of scope here, right? So if you're, um, for example, a car or a TV, you probably just wait for the user to naturally turn the device off and it'll just, next time they turn it back on, it will come up in the new version. Um, if it's something like a, like a router, which is powered up sort of all of the time, then you probably want to have some logic that figures out when would be a good time. So maybe you go and wait a couple of days for, um, for the user to, to naturally turn it off. And if not, just wait until 3 o'clock in the morning and, and trigger yourself a reboot. And then, obviously, a reboot comes up, system comes up in the new world. Um, so that's uh, the nature of the, of the OS tree um, part. But this is actually um, one part, and it's an important part, and it's a difficult part. Uh, but you still need to build that into a, into a whole system which pushes updates um, from some server down to some update client which identifies things like, um, which identifies the device to the server and then eventually hands off, hands off to OS tree. So the problems here are things like, we need to serve the update files themselves from somewhere. I mean, it's relatively straightforward, but they do need to be somewhere. Um, if, if the actual contents of your updates are considered secret, then that's a little bit harder. You need some way of um, authenticating devices to the server. And there's some support in OS tree um, for doing this. So you can pass in extra headers, which get um, pushed up to the server. So you can write a, an HTTPS server that authenticates the clients in whatever way you choose. Um, there's another part uh, which belongs on the server, which is um, deciding who gets what updates. Now, this is, this is the point where a thing that looks like a, a relatively quick Ruby on Rails hack 
is now starting to turn into something that's a little bit more complicated and it's probably going to be a nightmare by the time you finish. And, and this is always going to be the case that, okay, we want to have um, a beta test fleet or we want to be able to incrementally roll out an update um, across uh, maybe, okay, we'll first send it to like 1% of our customers and then we'll send it to 10% of our customers. And if none of those um, overload our support, our, uh, our support center, we'll, um, we'll roll it out to everybody. Um, and then there's always going to be the case where one particular customer who's a really important customer phones up and says it's broken and your developer says, can they just like try this version of the software just on that like one device, like right now please? Um, and uh, then of course your Ruby on Rails app grows another kind of pile of stuff um, and you can imagine this is going to turn into a nightmare, nightmare pretty quickly. Um, and then, and finally, there needs to be some method of provisioning new devices into the system. So, uh, if you're on a, if you're doing high volume devices, this will be somewhere on some production line. If it's a, a lower volume industrial IoT type place, then there's probably going to be some guy who does it. But he's still going to need a process by which you can say, okay, I've got a new device. I need to give it some secrets inside the device, and I need to match those secrets up somewhere on the server. And you're probably going to have to have some kind of database rather than a Google Docs spreadsheet that identifies um, you know, this, is, this is Mr. Brown's device and it's got this particular serial number. Um, so uh, options for that, basically, like if you already have this, then, um, then the thing to do is to, is to use our, uh, our OS tree uh, integration into Yocto. Talk about in a minute. Um, and then you just shell out to the OS tree tool or call it via it's got a really nice uh, C API that you can use to drive it. And then you get the underlying uh, atomic mechanics of updates, but you don't, um, you don't use any of the exist any of the server infrastructure. If you, um, if you don't have that thing already, then I would highly recommend not trying to write it yourself and, and use one. Um, they, remembering, of course, that the update server has the ability by design to install random bits of software on an entire um, fleet of devices. And uh, if some joker decides, it would be a funny laugh to go and um, push, a, push some malicious update to your entire fleet of devices. That's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be very bad news. Um, and it's gonna be bad news crossed with potentially very, very expensive to fix um, when you keep getting annoyed phone calls and have to physically ship these devices back to get them reprogrammed. Um, so we actually, um, have one of these, um, both a server and a client as a match pair. The, uh, the server is, um, is a Scala app, and the client is, we've got two implementations of the client, uh, one in Rust and one in C++, which is um, kind of a month or two away from being a, a production-ready uh, piece of software. Now, uh, these are both open source, uh, MPL licensed. They're, um, the original spec for this was developed by um, Genevieve, who are a automotive um, organization who wanted a software update system um, for, for, their, for their platform. Um, and so the requirements for it are not sort of something we've randomly made up. They've come from some sort of reasonably, uh, reasonably serious organization, um, designed, well, designed for automotive, but actually more generally applicable. Uh, to other systems, um, and it was actually ATS that, that did the development for this uh, under contract with Genevieve originally. Um, server um, is a Scala, has a Docker, um, has a Docker file that will run it. There's a bunch of microservices that work together. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to stand up. There's some docs for that. If you don't want to do that, then we also host it as a as a SaaS, um, and you can pay, and it's like a buck per device per month. Um, and we'll do the we'll do the hosting of that of that component for you. It's your call, your call, whichever, you, whichever makes more sense. And like the first twenty devices for that are free. So if you're just blessing with it, that's probably the easiest way to get started and just point it at the point it at the um, uh, ATS garage, um, and then uh, worry about the worry about the scale options later. So I've kind of described um, all of the components uh, for this solution. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the integration work we've done to integrate this. So uh, right now all the integration work is, is Yocto, so we haven't done the build root thing yet. It's probably not that hard, but we haven't done it. Um, so the, the layer you want is this layer called meta-updater. 
Um, and this provides integration with Yocto for building these images. Now, um, the, so the first, the first step of that um, is we have a new image type, which is effectively, um, it lives alongside create a tarball of my root FS, create an EXT uh, image of my root FS. Um, we have another one which is take my root FS and check it into an existing uh, OS tree repository, or commit it um, into an existing OS tree repository. An OS tree repository is just like Git, it's just a directory somewhere with a bunch of objects in it. Um, and that's the point where it becomes an OS tree thing. Um, there's also some code in there for generating the initial image for writing to Flash. Now, normally in, inside, a, inside a Yocto system, the root FS generated by uh, Yocto and the actual thing you write to Flash are very, very similar, right? You generate an ext4 image, and then you, on the Flash, you have a partition table and you smash it in there somewhere. Right? This is a bit more um, complicated uh, because, of, because of this, and so there's now quite a big distinction between the thing that you write to Flash and the root FS image from a, from a Linux user space point of view. And so uh, there's a recipe um, in MetaUp data, sorry, um, the, sorry, it's a BB class in MetaUp data that handles that distinction for you. Um, and finally, um, there's a bit of code which will upload um, changes from your local repository up to the server. Now, OS3 doesn't come with this functionality by default. Um, and so we have that, that piece in. And it does this in a reasonably um, smart way, so it will only upload objects which are not already on the server. And it does it in a way which is safe against um, updates, updates failing halfway through. Um, and it does quite a, a smart thing where it sort of walks this tree and knows, okay, if this node of the tree was on the server, then all of its dependent nodes are also available on the server, so it can, uh, it can skip pushing updates for nodes that are no longer, for whole parts of your software update tree which are, um, uh, which are already, which are duplicated, already, already on the server. Um, and that's quite nice because you can, you can build on a, uh, on a remote build machine and then push it up to an update server much, much quicker because it's only a few uh, tens of megabytes of files rather than having to ship an entire multiple hundred megabyte um, software update image across your network. And regardless of how fast it is, um, moving only a few hundred, few tens of megabytes is, is much better. Um, we actually uh, uh, considered uh, using this where we've hosted a build machine in Amazon AWS and then had um, the builds happening on AWS because you can buy some really like probably reasonably powerful boxes on AWS and then pushes that up to a build server and then incrementally downloads um, to your local development machine uh, and that can actually be quicker than building on my local machine even though there's lots of there's lots of bandwidth between my local machine and a flash card it's actually quite nice to be able to build it on a really fast machine and then um, just pull the updates incrementally um, so we've actually used that for, for development work um, so that's uh, meta data, which is um, completely general between um, any different board uh, that you want to target. So one of the goals here, remember, was that uh, in order for this system to be useful, it needs to be very easy to put it onto a new piece of hardware. So as much as possible of the work we've done is um, agnostic to the underlying hardware. Um, but there is a hardware-specific piece, and that's um, we've got a bunch of layers like meta data, something uh, which is basically the uh, bootloader integration uh, and sometimes some small changes to, to make it work on, on a specific hardware. Um, so we've done that so far for like QMU, um, Raspberry Pi, uh, and the Mino board Max Stroke Turbot. And if you're willing to dig it out of AGL, there's also one for the um, uh, Renesas R cardboard. But unless you're in the automotive world, you're probably not using that. Um, in fact, all of these um, we've done using we've done using U-boot, um, <laughs> uh, including the uh, the Miniboard Max, where it turned out it was actually quite easy to um, to build U-boot um, for that thing, and then just reflash uh, reflash the firmware, reflash replace the UEFI BIOS and the Mini Max with uh, with U-boot, and it works works a charm, and you don't end up with a UEFI firmware, which is nice. Um, okay, demo time. So, 
I cannot type while talking, um, so I thought I would record this. Uh, so um, what I want to show is uh, building a software updatable image um, for a Raspberry Pi, which can be updated over the air, and which is using uh, lots of nice open source components, so you can modify any of this. And I'm looking at you, uh, Android. So this is our example image, which pulls together um, a Pocky plus Meta Updater plus Meta Updater Raspberry Pi plus Meta Raspberry Pi, um, and a couple of support libraries, um, which you need. Uh, now the idea here is that for your own projects, assuming you have a have a, a project that's already working, it should basically be a matter of dropping Meta Updater into that project, uh, making a couple of small changes, and, and it will go. Um, so um, there's, there's very little by design um, work to do. It's, I assume you're gonna do it that way rather than take our base platform and then try and bring all of your, bring, bring all of your stuff into it. Um, so this is, this is what we've got. Um, uh, so here are the layers. Um, the Raspberry Pi example comes with a, with a script which helps you um, set up your BitBake. So we provide some um, template BB layers and local.conf to, to make getting started easier. And I'll just um, show you the layers here. So yeah, this is the standard set. Um, uh, the, the support library is Meta Rust because um, we're gonna build the, the Rust client. Uh, yeah. A couple of libraries from Meta OE. Um, and we're done, I think. Um, uh, so again, the, the local.conf is also, it's also very, very stock. Um, I just make a couple of changes here to, um, to use a, a standard set of download directories. So our build server has like slash Yocto downloads and slash Yocto estate cache shared between all the users on the build server, which is really nice because now um, if someone else has built uh, the code already, it's already in estate cache. Uh, this is actually really nice when you're reviewing pull requests from other people because you don't have to wait for ages for like Qt to rebuild because they've already done it as part of their as part of their update cycle and it just pulls it straight in. Um, so the only other change is um, this uh, distro here. Um, so we provide an example distro that does some of the underlying um, underlying magic here to bring in the bring in the OTA process, and um, I'd expect for your system. You just, just look at this distro, it's basically just Pocky plus a small ink file that's our own. So you just copy that ink file into your own distro and it should, uh, should work out of the box. Um, this is using systemd, we also support um, sys5 in it as well. I'm gonna scroll to the end of this to prove that there's nothing magic going on. Right. Um, so the image is, is completely, is your standard image, there's no changes needed there. This is our play basic image, which is basically core image minimal plus some extra stuff, and that's provided by, um, by Meta Raspberry Pi. It like makes the Wi-Fi work and things like that. So we'll sit and wait for the next hour for this to build. Um, and now we're, uh, we're at the point where we're um, uh, building RootFS. So this is creating the uh, initial um, RootFS. And then, remember I said we had these, um, this image OS tree, which is like similar to the tar or ext, um, ext4 targets. Um, uh, so this is the point where it takes all the files, checksums them, and writes the file index box checksum into the, uh, into this OS tree repository directory. Uh, we create the OTA image. Um, this is the transform rootfs image, which is the thing we're actually going to write onto the, onto the physical rootfs onto the file system. This is the thing that includes uh, potentially multiple copies of the OS. Um, and we're done. So um, now I'm going to uh, write this from SD card and stick it on the, on the Raspberry Pi. You have to imagine the Raspberry Pi part of this because um, so I didn't record that. Uh, so you just DD this image um, that we create Onto the onto the card. Um, so fortunately, I'm not building this on my laptop. Um, my laptop has a funky um, uh, one of these funky new SSDs on it, 
And the, the net outcome of that is that the first SD card that you plug into your device is called slash dev slash SDA. And I still cannot get over the fact of typing a command line that looks like sudo dd if equals something of equals slash dev slash SDA. Like every time I type that, I'm like, oh, I'll press the button. Um, unless you SSH somewhere else. Um, so uh, there's a couple more steps uh, that I'm doing here. Um, uh, and this is to resize the file system uh, image to fill uh, the entire SD card I have. So when it built this image, it built it as small as possible and I deeded it in, and so the partition is very small. So I'm using Parted to resize that out to fill um, the entire SD card, however big the SD card happens to be. Uh, resize the partition and then resize the file system inside it. Um, if you don't do that, you'll hit weird errors uh, when you try and perform updates because it'll say I don't have any file system left because it's, um, it's compacted the, um, Yocto has compacted the file system down to the smallest possible size. Now, um, the next thing I need to do is um, to link this, this device, uh, this file system I've built on, a, on an SD card uh, up to the software update server. So I'm just using this as our, our SAS hosted uh, update server. Um, so it, it does all the things you'd expect. There's sets of devices, so I'll add one here. Um, so I'll just give it a name for its own purpose. And this is going to generate a config file, um, which I'm going to stick on the device. And that's the link of, between the, the device and the particular update server. Um, so you can set some configuration here, like how often it polls um, the server. And the output is this um, little um, ini file, which you have to stick on the device. Now the actual, um, the process here can go, can go various ways. In a production situation, um, the back end of this is drivable via a REST API. So if you want to script it, you can do that. For this, I'm just um, for test and development, I just manually drive it. Um, so we also need to, um, copy this file somewhere onto the device. Now, various ways of doing that. Um, I'm, uh, the one relatively straightforward way is to just SSH into the device, um, or you can send it over um, some uh, modem protocol. But I'm just gonna write it by mounting the file system and copying it in. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, the layout of the file system um, on the actual SD card, so you can see um, the root doesn't look like a normal Unix root, but then there's um, inside this relatively long directory, there are, this is the one deployment we already have, and then right inside there is my original, um, my Linux user space, uh, as it will be. I don't have time. All right. Okay, so I'll just, uh, just copy that file in. Now, it's important to copy this into a uh, into the right place. This wants to be somewhere on the file system which is not overwritten as part of the as part of the update process. So I'm going to stick it in the uh, slash boot directory and our default integration assumes that's where you stick it. And it's a BB append if you want to stick it somewhere else. Um, okay, so that's it. That's the device um, configured. Um, I'll just unmount that and, and stick it into the Raspberry Pi. And this is the bit that you can't see happening in the background. It's the Raspberry Pi boots, um, and uh, as soon as it boots, it's going to uh, get a network connection, come online, uh, and and talk up and say hello. And when it does say hello, um, we recognise it now exists as a device, and um, we can uh, install software on it. Now, one of the other parts of the integration we've done is we use uh, LSHW to report all of the hardware on the local device, and that's just appeared on this right hand side here. So you can see what kind of device it is. Um, also, it's like IP address, which is probably one of the most useful parts of this entire functionality, um, which lets you work out, okay, this device that's sat next to me, um, like what IP address does it have right now, please? Uh, turns out to be super useful. Uh, we also, just about to see here, um, we report all of the packages which are installed on the device, and this is derived from the Yocto information, um, uh, and that's reported um, back up to the server as well. Um, and this is quite nice. So for example, it lets you do things like answer when another, when the latest um, vulnerabilities for some package comes in, you really want to be able to find out where that package is right now. So I'm going to do this for SSL, not picking on anyone in particular. Um, so we wake up one morning, it's all over Hacker News that there's a new attack and it's called Legbleed. Um, and 
now what it's done is it's uh, marked that package as being bad, and then you can inspect this database and find out which um, which devices are, are currently have known bad pieces of software in it. Okay, um, so that's the end of my demo. Um, so we've shown there going from um, uh, basically a completely stock Raspberry Pi image, the thing you would do if you went to the Meta Raspberry Pi um, uh, GitHub page and got that set up. We added a couple more layers, um, and then we built it, and now we have a software updatable uh, Raspberry Pi image, uh, and that will work for, um, for any particular um, board that you have already. Um, so I should um, describe a bit about our future plans. So um, more boards out of the box um, is quite high up on our list of things to do. If you have a particular board um, that you would like to support, then please drop us an email. We can probably figure it out. Uh, if, you're, um, if you're a vendor and would dearly like to support your board, then maybe just like send me one and I'll, I'll see what I can do to make that work. Um, if you're super keen and want to go and bring up your own board and release it as a community thing, then come talk to me because um, we might be able to grease that process a little bit. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's on, on, my, on my set of plans for this uh, is to speed up the root FS creation. So um, right now when you create the root file system, you basically do an RPM install, more or less, of every single RPM um, into, a, into a blank uh, directory. Now, there is actually already most of those RPMs are installed. Uh, no S3 knows about them. And it's, it's possible, and I haven't worked out the exact details, to be able to do this, increment, to do this incrementally and safely where we use um, uh, OS, we basically would uh, check in the output of every single RPM install and then merge them together um, as a final process. And this would mean that the, the bottleneck of recreating a root FS that currently, even with fast hardware, takes tens of seconds, could be reduced down to a few seconds, um, which would mean that it would be possible to effectively have a, a compile edit run cycle in the, in the sort of tens of seconds range which is completely impossible with any system which involves uh, tarring up or creating an EXT file system for this entire content. Um, that's not super easy, but will be, um, will be amazingly powerful. And because we can incrementally push those changes up and incrementally fetch them down, you could type a few make change a few lines um, on an external source that's checked out locally, hit build, and have it running on three or four devices you know, in, inside a minute. Um, and finally, uh, the um, boot watchdog and rollback uh, is one of those aspects which is obviously necessary, but is quite bootloader specific. And so we've so far not done that in the in the, in the public in the public version. Um, but it's quite straightforward to do, and we would like to do that to a few boards. Uh, but this is again is running into it into the problem that it often uh, watchdog doing a watchdog properly often requires interaction with the. Uh, with specific hardware which is on the board, and it's quite hard to do that in a general fashion. Um, so, finally, links, so you can find them if you uh, look at the presentation. Um, this is OS3, this is the cool thing that we didn't do. Um, this is the thing that we did do, uh, Meta Updater, and the, the demo I showed you was uh, this Garage Quick Start RPI. Um, so that's literally just like, Git clone that demo, minus minus, please use git submodules. Um, two commands, and you've got uh, software up, software over your updatable um, Raspberry Pi system. I think they've just added QMU support into it. I noticed a pull request went in whilst I was out here that they've um, extended that so it runs QMU in the same, in the same system. Um, OK, um, that's me. Thank you very much. I'm Phil Wise from ATS. Um, has anybody got any questions? Go ahead, sir. Yeah, so there are systems which most people use with Google for a particular scheme for the right to launch it. And one of the advantages you didn't mention is that it sort of protects a little bit against an act of flash failures. Right? You don't really have here. The real question is this when you're doing the dual boot uh, partition stuff, one of the things is you have to read and write and fly because you have nowhere to store your email set before again. So typically, you will mount some other device and pull that in, right? Now, here, uh, I think it's somebody so you. Pull the updates and then you deploy. Yep. Now, does it mean system unpredictable? So you're not sure how much memory you're going to need 
where does that where does that stuff stay before you do the appointment? And if so, if you need memory allocated for that, and does that become unpredictable because you don't know how big your upgrade is going to be? Is that an issue? Okay. Um, so okay. To, so it does work. So summary of the question. Um, what do we? How does OS Tree work when the size of the updates is large compared to um, the system resources? So what happens if you have a very big update? Can we run out of flash or memory or something that um, whilst doing the update? So uh, and, and so you said for the for the dual bank system, you basically stream in the delta updates and then use that versus the old to, to build the new. Um, Okay, so for OS Tree, your underlying flash requirements are fundamentally uh, the size of the old thing plus the size of the new thing, less any files which are shared between the two. So it's like the intersection of those two of those two sizes. Um, so the absolute worst case is is double, right? If you change every single file in a system, you need twice the storage. Um, now, if, you, if you're more careful about your updates, and like they're going to get tested anyway, right? So you're going to know how big that overup is. You can then have bigger file systems with a restriction that you can't update every single file um, in a single software update. Um, the, so the overheads you need for downloading are um, basically the size of one file as it comes off the network. And um, we're just doing some work right now uh, to bound that securely. So right now you can potentially send a very large file and it will keep downloading it um, up until the point where it realizes it's way too big and then it will give up. Um, but we can, we can bound that much tighter by saying, okay, what's the largest update? Um, but the um, because it's pulling objects individually, and those objects will generally have a relatively small size, uh, the, there's no point where it has to store any very, very large um, thing, basically, because the, the largest thing it has to store is the largest file in the system. And maybe if you have a maps database, that could be quite big. Um, but I guess in your case, maybe not, and they're all normal Unix sort of sizes. Um, and then... The, the checkout process is only creating um, only creating a directory tree, basically. So that's like zero. Well, it's not quite zero, but it's relatively small um, as a file size. Um, does that sort of answer the question? I don't think I. Yeah. So you're pulling the single object to solve it. Higher. Otherwise, you're pulling the entire file first. Oh yes. So we we pull the entire update first, um, but once but they. The extra files we create there will only be the differences between the two, um, because files that are already some, used somewhere else will just be uh, will just keep the one that's already there. Um, and then once you've got that locally, it's then mostly a hard linking process to create the actual root file system. Cool. So if you do this multiple times, yep. I mean, is there some pruning process to clean out the old updates? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. So. Um, Again, thank you, OS Tree. It does all this for us. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, by default, it keeps two. Um, and objects which are not referenced by either of those two will be deleted. Uh, you can change that number. Uh, I mean, it's not completely obvious to me why you, why you might want to do that. But maybe you might want to have a very quick process of switching between two or three versions, in which case there's a, there's a setting uh, inside OS Tree somewhere for what that number is. Uh, but yeah, it prunes things out as they're, as they're finished. Uh, yes. So, if you have, um, so if you can get the files to somewhere that the target device can see, um, I'm pretty sure that works. I've never done it with a USB drive. Um, I've definitely done it with just a dumb HTTP server. So, if you've got a laptop, you can just serve the files off Apache on there and then send them over. Um, I'm pretty sure the USB case works, as in you just mount it as a USB stick and, and pull from there. 
Um, I've never tried it though, so I won't promise it works, but I'm pretty sure that's, if it doesn't work today, it's, it'll be a very, very small change, because it's, you could probably just do it by um, R-syncing, in fact, you could do it just by R-syncing the copy of the USB stick over your existing OS3 repository. Uh, modulo, but yeah. Um, but, I mean, worst case is HTTP server. Any more questions? Okay, cool, well, thank you for your attention. And, uh...